something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's around 10 to 15, I think. Yeah. But, um, the thing I'm most curious about this is like, I always think back, like I, years ago when I started hiking, I took my wife and kids, like, I think we were going to Cave Mountain and Bartlett. And instead of me staying on the Langdon Trail, I went on this like um, logging road. And I was like, oh, I think this is a shortcut. And we went down this logging road and I was clearly like, I didn't know where the hell I was going. But I wouldn't, I was not going to let that on to my wife because she like, she's like, we're lost. And I was like, we're not lost. Um, but I, we were clearly lost. So then I had to like have us cut across and like do this little bushwhack. Eventually we found the trail. But like she literally still brings that up to this day that we got lost. <laughs> and I can only imagine like if something like this happened where we were like took the kids out in the middle of the woods with no lights and no water and the kids were having a melt. Like it would be, it would be all over for me. So I can only imagine like what happened while they're like deciding at what point do they call my mom what. Yeah, and now there's a pecuniary penalty, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah. Now there's a bill <laughs> to make it even more rem- memorable. <laughs> oh boy! Broadcasting from the Woodpecker Studio in the great state of New Hampshire. Welcome to the Sounds Like a Search and Rescue podcast, where we discuss all things related to hiking and search and rescue in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Here are your hosts, Mike and Stomp. All right, Stomp, so we are uh, episode 20. So what were you doing when you were 20 years old? I, I don't remember. My brain fails me, but I just recently I was buying gas. I was filling my tank for about 20. Now I'm paying about 40 or 50. <laughs> Is that oh, for your for your car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, twenty. Well, I was still waiting to be twenty-one. Yeah, yeah. Same with me. Twenty is kind of like that teaser. It's like I got a whole nother year before I can start drinking and partying. Yeah, I got to travel Europe. That was pretty cool. You did. Oh did hell yeah! In Europe, did you go? Central Europe. I started up in Germany and uh, made my way by train and hostel all the way down to. Mykonos and I think that you know Santorini I went as far down as Santorini in Greece you know the Greek Isles and then back uh just backpacking you know just jumping on trains and it was really wild incredible time really I wouldn't have pictured that for you I didn't think you were that uh, that much of an aristocrat that you'd be going over to Europe backpacking like well that. I, I had a reason I had to bring my my Oma I was sort of the guide I was the the escort for my my Oma who was getting on in her years and she went back to Germany before she passed to see her family. I mean, she still had sisters in, in uh, Hamburg. So there was a mission behind it. We had to get her to see her family. And um, once she was settled, I just took off for a while and saw Europe. So pretty neat. I lived on cheese and beer for like a month and a half. Oh, nice. <laughs> I guess that's, I'll that's never forget the way it. to go. You? Yeah, it was pretty yeah, intense. I mean, that's a good trip. I always yeah. regret that I didn't get a chance to do something like that when I was younger. So I think if mm. anybody's listening, like I always tell, even I tell my own kids, I'm like, definitely either like during college or the time between college and when you start your life, I think everybody should do one of those sort of epic trips, whether it's like through hiking the AT or going to Europe or mm. like I met a guy when I was in Iceland and he was like a master student that had just graduated from Harvard and he was like um, bike packing around the perimeter of Iceland for like 30 days or something. So that's amazing. Everybody should do some cool adventure like that, I think. Yeah, it's true because those windows uh, close on you. When I got back from Europe, I said to myself, oh, I can't wait to go back again. Nope. Never happened again. Yeah. Life yeah. just it takes sucks. twists and turns. Yeah, <laughs> next thing you know, you're 50 with a hip replacement. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, that's true. Hopefully like, not. No hair. Hmm. Yeah, it happens quick, Rebecca. Trust me. <laughs> hey, hair is overrated. Oh yeah, yeah it is. that's true. Yeah, <laughs> it is. So, ever since I got my hair back, I've just kind of still not cared that much about it. I thought I'd care a lot more. I think my mom cares more than I do. Mm-hmm. Well, once it's long, you'll you can start doing stuff with it. You can start like braiding it and doing fun fun things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do have a much smaller forehead than I remember. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely um, not as large when you have hair. So, although mine has always been kind of big. So, so Rebecca, <laughs> do you know the new news this week? We hit 10k, uh, 10k downloads. 
I saw that. Yeah, That's it's pretty awesome. slick. Awesome. Yeah, it's cool. So it's 10,000 10, individual people, right? No, individual or... downloads. Yeah, we have a, a small but devoted following. But so since we started, it's been um, 10,000 downloads. Yeah. That's awesome. It's really neat. I'm so excited. Yeah, the audience is growing. I'm really picky about podcasts, and this is one of the few ones that I'll actually watch or mm. listen to. Like, um, I tend to only listen to hiking podcasts too. Yeah. I'd rather listen to music, but I, I like this one a lot because I know you guys and it's local and it's like stuff that I, I don't know. I enjoy listening to it because you do a good job. Oh, well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's niche. I mean, it's like there's only so many people that are into the White Mountains, but it's still, you know, I think it's inner. I just figured like when we started this dumb podcast, I was like, I just want to start a podcast that like I would listen to on the drive up to go hiking. It <laughs> seems to have resonated. So mm-hmm. I actually listened to the one that you guys talked about, uh, like a reflection on COVID. That was the one I most recently listened to. I was hiking East Side Trail, I think. Any thoughts? I liked it. No, I liked how you... to, no, 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 no feedback. Oh yeah, no Remember feedback. So rule. No feedback. Well, <laughs> can I give you feedback about the the Facebook group and about the oh. tick session? jokes? You can you can give me feedback about tick jokes. That's cool. No, no Who tick is... jokes. But yeah, no. so Re- <laughs> so Rebecca is talking about like if you're if you're uh, listening to the show, you can join the Facebook group. It's called Sounds Like a Search and Rescue is about to happen and the DM group is being inundated with cat. It, the the, uh, the <laughs> cat pictures have taken over the group for some reason. So <laughs> Stomp has cats. Rebecca's got a new kitten and everybody's posting pictures of kittens now. So I, don't, I guess we're an officially like, a, a cat show for now on. It's just so random. Don't take offense, but I really don't visit the, the page. I, I get secondhand information from my wife. But with the information she gives me is like, hmm, that eyebrow raising. Like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's like the one place I can go on social media that I don't feel like it's being filtered. And I like that about it. Because it's like I can go on there and I know that it's not going to be, I don't know. It's like people that whoever is in that group, I don't really know anyone that's part of the group. I just know that they just, <laughs> there's like no holds barred or Whatever that phrase is, I love it. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, you get a good moderator. And I, and I don't do any moderation at all. So it's just <laughs> exactly. Long, but, yeah, so I guess that's the, that's probably it's a good thing or it could be a, bar, a bad thing. It'll burn to the ground at some point, I'm sure. But, um, but Stomp, do we have any sponsors to plug? Don't we have to plug a sponsor now? I think we do. Yeah, a big one. Um, we just sat down with Reckless for our last episode, and some of you – have probably heard it by now, but um, yeah, big plug out to Reckless. They are sponsoring the show now, and um, we had a great guest, uh, Steve, one of the brewers over there. And uh, yeah, it's fantastic. Um, great, very supportive brewery of local talent, and um, they're uh, stepping up to the plate and helping us out here. And um, if anybody's in the area, they're in Bethlehem, and uh, highly recommended. Their their craft beer is just phenomenal. I mean, they put a lot of time and effort into their recipes, and um, it's a great environment, great food, great music. Wink, wink. We're working on possibly having some uh, EDM there uh, via me, which is pretty exciting. I've always wanted to do something like that locally, so that's pretty cool. It's in the works. So EDM, that's uh, electronic dance music, right? Yeah, yep. That's like when you go to raves, right? Well, raves, yeah, trance shows. Um, I mean, there are so many celebrity DJs now that you can go to a show that's just billed as their name under the marquee. So it's a huge movement. I mean, it's just massive, massive audience worldwide. When was your first rave that you went to, Stomp? I'm curious. Um. I've never been to a like an underground rave, if that's what you're talking about. I've never yeah, yeah, never yeah. done that. Um, I've always been into dance music, and like um, I, I got really turned on to music back in junior high school. There was a DJ uh, north of Boston, Steve Spinelli, who was mixing mixtapes on cassette, and I just became his friend, and he would give me mixtapes every week. And this is like the Run DMC days, and like really early stuff and um i've always been a fan of just four on the floor disco and 
I know it sounds funny, but I love it. I'm just addicted to it. And now um, it's come so far. Everything's digital, and you have these turntables that are all digital, but it's like actually using an old school turntable, uh, but no records involved at all. It's all MP3s, and it's incredible. Yeah, I, I do watch some of those some some DJ videos on like YouTube and things like that, and it does seem like the technology is like crazy how they how they uh, oh, it's tie it into the computers and they mix everything together. Yeah. We'll, have to, we'll have to put up some of your EDM tapes on the show note links. Oh, that'd be cool. But uh, in terms of like recent shows, I mean, you know, Royale and all these different clubs, um, some of these talents will come through, and the shows are just phenomenal. There for me as an audio audio producer, it's more of a sonic experience for me. And the music itself is beautiful, and the production value that they put into these songs actually is a lot more complicated than people would think. So, I'm an audiophile. I just, I just absolutely love it for its complexity and um, the energy at these shows. It's just, it's just awesome. Love it. Yeah. Well, I'm not that into music, but I did go back in the '90s. I was like, I used to go to raves quite a bit um, when they first started becoming like a thing, and I remember going to like Fitchburg at the hockey hockey rink in Fitchburg and they would have like these underground raves where um <laughs> everyone would go and I remember one of my friends trying to buy like I think he thought it was ecstasy and somebody sold them like a pill for like ten dollars and it was like a Tylenol and he, I was like dude that's a Tylenol like that's not <laughs> and uh but it was all like it was so funny because I think raves were popular like in California and we would all go to these raves in Fitchburg and it would be a bunch of like sort of reformed metal heads and like <laughs> frat guys going into these raves and then there'd be all these blue haired girls twirling around with the you know the the lights and it was just a weird mix of like the, all the guys there were not there because they cared about raves they were just there to meet girls it exactly like, well things have been changed time back then yeah i'm sure yeah the the attendees are the same that hasn't changed yeah. so that's my rave story rebecca have you ever been to a rave no, I've been to one club in Boston and that was it. I'm not a big, I guess, party person. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. I um, I went to one, like, literally one time. That's the only time I've ever been to a club. And it was it was interesting. Um, I guess not really my scene, but it was definitely kind of a neat experience to get to go do that, mm -hmm. uh, see what it was like. Um, I had a lot of friends who were... Uh, interested in in partying and stuff, but mostly it was just like let's hang out at someone's house, not really like let's go to a club. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Yeah, for yeah, those days are far in my rearview mirror at this point. So, um, but maybe we'll go and we'll go to the EDM show at Reckless Brewing when when Stomp gets over there or something. So it should be mm -hmm. a good time. Sounds good. Yeah, it's funny. All right. Um, any other any other housekeeping stuff, Stomp? I think we have to. I think by the time the show is released, we'll have a link where people can donate to offset the production cost of the show. It'll be, I think, slasher podcast slash buy me a coffee. Um, and then if you do want to sponsor the show, we'll have some information up on the uh, the slasher podcast site about how you can do that. And basically, what we're asking is if you donate to a search and rescue organization, and you can show us a receipt, we will we'll put a put in a plug for the for the uh, the organization and the show. And then also always buy us a hike safe card to help um, support fishing game. Those are available, and we'll we'll put a link on the the show notes on how to do that as well. Yeah. On to the show summary here. So um, tonight we are welcoming back Rebecca. Welcome, Rebecca. Hey, Rebecca. Um, so she's coming hello. back to the show to talk about... Oh, yeah, hello. Socked in. Um, so Rebecca's here to talk about trail maintenance. Um, so she was on, I think, episode eight, uh, but we brought her back because she's since adopted a trail. And, um, you know, since the last time we spoke with her, she's been busy making sure that her trail is in great shape for all of us to enjoy. Um, and she's also been out hiking all over the place, so I'm sure that we'll catch up with some of her recent adventures. We're also going to talk about a couple of recent hikes that Stomp and I have been on that involve some slides and some bushwhack. So we wanted to share details about those hikes because we thought that the audience might be interested. So if you're looking to get off of the trail and find some lesser traveled parts of the whites, we've got you covered. And then later in the show, we are going to cover recent search and rescue news, and also talk about a push 
to rename um, some federal locations. Uh, so there's a there's recent legislation that's being pushed through where um, the Congress is trying to basically look at renaming um, rivers, lakes, forest information. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and get get Stomp and Rebecca's thoughts about that. So so I'm Mike and I'm Stomp. Let's get started. Very good. So uh, bear talk, Stomp. What are you drinking? No beer tonight. I was going to grab some uh, Reckless. Sorry, guys, but we had a call today and I got diverted. So I'm just back to the old whiskey sour. That's my EDM drink. And and it's because I'm freezing to death. I, I The weather may be nice and sunny down here in um, Thornton, but it is raining like cats and dogs up on uh, Southern Prezies. Yeah, yeah, it's... It's misty and gross up there. So, yeah. All right. So, no, you? no drinking for me either. I got I to get up to North Conway to get over to Grant's to buy myself some Reckless because from now on, that's all I'm drinking on the show. <laughs> They're going to have to come up with new brews every week to keep up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we know if Rebecca doesn't drink. That's fine. Are you? drinking any tea no but i'm thinking about getting some cheetos i want some cheetos right now <laughs> that'll get you through the show <laughs> love them <laughs> my do- my daughters Go will for always, it. they call uh, my you, i don't know if you know this but like my daughters will call their friends they'll be like she's a hot cheeto girl <laughs> i guess that's the thing what? amongst the kids like they'll be like oh she eats hot cheetos <laughs> i don't know apparently it's an insult amongst the young crowd <laughs> but I like cheetos. Uh, <laughs> that's yeah, crazy. there's some strange terminology out there. Hot Cheetos. Yeah, huh. yeah. It's so I have like all teenagers now, so I, I learn all, all the weird sayings. So if you hot want to insult cheetos. someone moving forward, just be like, You're a hot Cheetos girl. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. No, uh, that is a flavor, right? Hot Cheeto? Like a jalapeno. I think cheeto? it is, yeah. <laughs> the yeah. Kids get this I'm more stuff. of a cheese its guy than a Cheetos guy, but I like them both. <laughs> I got oh. cheese. It's also <laughs> cheese. It's a good. I do like those. Yeah, I do, I do like those. Um, that's a good. That's one of my hiking snacks. Like I'll have same thing with my wife. I usually will throw in a bag like cheese. It's pistachios and then peanut M and M's. That's kind of like like my go to mix. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my wife's early hiking days cheese. It's were uh, her staple, and if she didn't get them at like the summit, she would go through these like um, hypoglycemic abouts and she would just get pissed and that was of course the only the only object of her wrath at the time and it was just tough so there was this one time we did uh cannon the cannonballs came back down and had to had to walk the bike path back and then we jumped on the pemi trail which you're gonna do soon mike and she she hit she hit the wall and uh was like just yelling at me and I, we call that trail like uh Cheese it, cheese it lake, and cheese it trail because of the episode. <laughs> good memories. So right. well, we're gonna do a we're gonna do a deep dive on oh, um, good stuff. Two specific hikes, stomp. So don't include. So I want to talk about recent hikes, but don't include the one that we're gonna do with the deep dive on. Uh, aside from that trip with Jimmy Chaga to Liberty, have you done any other hikes recently? <clears throat> no. No, I have not because there's been such an uptick in rescue activity that that's my hiking. I've had enough. I'm good with the mountains for a little bit. It has been. It's been crazy. In like terrible weather, people are hiking. Uh, It's just crazy. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, I think we've got, let me see here, one, two, three, four news stories to cover. Not to mention you just went out on one today that I'm sure we'll cover at some point. Mm. in a future episode yeah it's been it's been busy for sure crazy so yeah and how about how about you mike yeah i've done i've done a couple of hikes so i and then kind of rainy day hikes too but on the i think it's it was fourth of july weekend i got up to sugarloaf mountain which is the the sugarloaf not in crawford notch but the one that is off of in nash stream forest have you ever have you ever been there? I have. Rebecca? Have you been there on that one? Yeah, I did that one last summer. That's a nice... Um, it's awesome. I love that area. The Percy Peaks are beautiful. Mm. Yeah. They're right near that. They're right down the road from the Sugarloaf Trail. Yeah, yeah, I did that last last fall. The frame of the fire tower is still up at the top of that one. Yeah, yeah. But um, Sugarloaf was cool. It was like... I. I 
I was the only, I didn't see a single car driving up Nash Stream Road and I didn't see a single hiker the whole way up. I just, I saw a baby deer that was kind of cool, but I was kind of spooked out because it was rainy and like, you know, you get those days where it's like rainy and dark and you know that like there's nobody else around and you're solo and you just start like something just got in my head. I was like this Sasquatch out there, there's, there's aliens going to come and duck me. So um, it was okay, but there was no view. So I sort of like did it because I'm working on the 52 with a view list, but I got to get back there to, um, to see it with a view. So I may actually, that would actually be a good one for all of us to do is to go up and do Percy Peaks. And then maybe if we felt like we had energy, we'd go up and do Sugarloaf. So <clears throat> sounds good. Yeah. I love it up there too. That would, but that was number 50 for me for 52 with a view. And then I also got out to, I found a secret spot stop. I don't know if I should give it away. <laughs> In that area? Nash Stream? No, no, no. It's in it's in Western Maine. Okay. I feel like I shouldn't give this. Away. I'm going to regret this, but I'm I, I, for the audience's sake, I will give you. And so, have you, you guys ever heard of Mount Cutler in Hiram, Maine? I have. Yeah. So Hiram is like on the other side of Freiburg, and this tra these trail systems. I don't think they're on all trails, or uh, maybe they're on all trails, but they're not on um, G uh, Gaia. GPS, but like Mount Cutler has this trail system in Hiram, and it's it's pretty cool. It's like it's pretty low, but there's all these trails, there's miles of them. I think I did about four miles, and there's a bunch of great views out into Western Maine and looking down into the Saco and stuff. So it's definitely a cool area. So I would recommend that people go check it out. Just don't go there when I'm hiking. I don't I don't want to see anybody else, but it's it's a cool <coughs> area. <laughs> Will do. Yeah. And Rebecca, you've been everywhere. Like I see you. No kidding, like, right? It, like we could be here all night talking about where you've been hiking. But like, what was your what? What is your one most recent hike that you've just done? One, Rebecca. Uh, yesterday. Yeah, only one. So yes. Okay. Well, <laughs> yesterday I did um, Gordon Path and Brook Path, which are in the um, Wanalansa area. Mm -hmm. So Ferncroft is where you park for uh, Whiteface Pass Conway, that parking lot. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you know where that is. Oh yeah, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm looking. Okay, so there's there. I'm working on um the on redlining. So I was doing trails towards that yesterday. Uh, I kind of am working on. I don't even know. I'm not really working on anything. I'm just doing what I feel like doing. But those two trails I needed to do, so I did those two. Um, and Brook Path is so pretty. Like oh, I was really, really surprised because I thought it was gonna be like really awful and hard to navigate because it's a, it's called brook path and we just got all this rain and i'm like this is going to be a nightmare um and it was beautiful and it runs along a brook shockingly and, and um it's just it's yeah it's really pretty and it's not um there's not very much there's like hardly any elevation at all and then uh as i was walking the road back to my car I, it was a little kind of a little creepy because there's all these signs on the side of the road that say bear dogs are not allowed in this area because it's a bear conservation area and i'm like oh mm. this is safe and just was out meandering in the woods in the bear conservation area <laughs> <laughs> so that was interesting and then gordon path was kind of boring i wasn't super thrilled with it but whatever, I had to do it, so it's... Yeah, so you're just sort of vaguely, like, going to areas where you haven't hiked before and just knocking yeah. off trails for the red line and... Yeah, just kind of working on bits and yeah. pieces. That sandwich range is like, it's like a spider web down there. I'm just looking at the map as you're talking. Mm -hmm. There's a lot there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's all sorts of weird stuff going on. It's kind of almost like the Northern Prezies, where it's like yeah. that off Appalachia parking lot. But, yeah, I, I've been all over the place. I mean, I was in Vermont last week doing the long trail a couple of days on the long trail and then i was doing the, the new england hunter highest in vermont i mean i just i like to keep it interesting after last summer where i was only doing one thing this summer i'm like i'm doing whatever i want and i'm doing everything no you you've been on the move definitely the, the executive producer is purring check it out oh boy stomp's Aww. got his cats going again i don't know where the kitten went i have no clue Actually, I forgot that it's I happy. had a we're, doing, we're, we're knocking it out of the ballpark. 
when she oh purrs, boy. we're doing a good I, job. I, I can't get away from cats <laughs> this week. I don't know. Why what's doesn't going on. Mike like cats? What is the problem? <laughs> no, I don't mind them. I'm just I'm, I want a dog. You need one. Get, get me a dog. So it's you got sad. a bunny rabbit. But apparently. do you know? Well, speaking of dogs, like you had just talked about that sign about the no. No bear, no bear dogs. dogs. Have you, yeah. Yeah. Have you guys ever, like, I, it made me think about, like, I forgot about this, but I, last year I was hiking up by um, Rattle River. I start, I went up to, I think, Mount Hayes and uh, the entrance. So from Rattle River to get to the trail that gets to Mount Hayes, there's like a road walk there and there's like a pond or whatever. And I remember like, walking down and all of a sudden like i could see like three dogs running towards me and i was like i immediately went into like mass hole mode i'm like i need to look to see if they, and there's nobody around so i was like i need to look to see if they've got collars and i've got to like get them on a leash and i've got to save these dogs and they shouldn't be running around loose or whatever mm -hmm. and um the dogs are like all running and like only one of them came near enough to me and like I checked the collar and they were beer dogs. They like, it was like, leave me alone. Don't, I forget what it said on the collar, but it was basically like, I'm not lost. I'm, I'm hunting or whatever. So these dogs were just like, I, I guess they're just roaming loose to find beers or something. I don't know if they had GPS on their collars or something, but like, that's a thing up there. I didn't even know, but I, I thought I, I was going to take them all to like the MSPCA and save them, but they were like, leave me alone. I'm a, I'm a regular hunting dog. Hmm. That's really weird. I didn't know that. I would have never known that was a thing, I guess. Mm -hmm. If you are a, um, a wannabe hero with these dogs, then I would say leave them alone if you're up in Maine because they're, they're actually working. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Good to know. Yeah. Slasher's Hiking Topic of the Week. Rebecca's back to talk about this uh, subject. Trail maintenance is obviously a pretty critical um, endeavor, and there are a good number of people that are involved doing this week to week, committing a lot of time, almost probably comparable to some search and rescue volunteer time, I would think, in some circles. That'd be an interesting number to dig up. Trail maintenance, obviously, you have trails that uh, you have blowdowns, you have the water diversion. I don't even know what you call them, to be honest with you. I'm fairly ignorant about this. But all that stuff has to be maintained, and it is up to the trail maintainers to do this. So we're glad to have you here. I've seen your activity out there on the trails with other folks, and i um, glad you're here to talk about it. I've, I've tried to become a trail maintainer, but I ran into some hurdles where they just didn't get back to me, so that's sort of weird. Maybe you can touch upon that at some point. Why don't you take it away? How did you get involved? Um, so originally in 2017, I talked to Mike Cherum. He is pretty involved in the Whites. I took one of his classes through his organization, and um, I talked to him about how I was interested in giving back to the trails, and he ended up kind of pointing me in the right direction. So he's like, you should reach out to the White Mountain National Forest um, Trail Adopters Organization. And so I ended up, you can just kind of Google it actually, mm -hmm. and it's pretty easy to find. But the White Mountain National Forest has a, a page that is for trail adopters. Yeah. And there's various individuals who are kind of in charge of the different areas in the state. Um, now that I know more about, there's a ton of organizations that maintain the different trails all over the state. So there's a Facebook group for the trail adopters, mm -hmm. and that's actually a really great place to start. They actually have a ton of resources, and they have a, a list of all of the different trails that are or orphaned. So trails that are orphaned are the ones that no one has adopted. Um, that doesn't mean that no one's maintaining them, but oftentimes that is kind of the case. So um, it is, I think, the White Mountain National Forest Volunteers and then the New Hampshire Trail Workers Group are two Facebook groups that I'm part of. And the people, the person who runs those pages, um, they post stuff all the time about orphaned trails and ways to get involved. Yeah. Are there expectations from these groups about how much time to put in or? There's no official expectation in terms of hours through the White Mountain National Forest Trail Adoption. They would like to have you obviously go out twice a year. So they like to have whoever has adopted a trail go out in the spring and in the fall okay. to do trail work. And there's different levels of trail work. So there's level one is what we do. It's reasonable. So 
trail adopters are level one at maintenance, which means we do water, water bars, which is what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, and we do brushing and then we do small cuts if there's trees and stuff, but you have to actually get additional training if you want to do like ax or you definitely are not going to be doing any sort of chainsaw work, things like that. That's not where we're at as trail adopters. So mainly what you're doing is you're brushing out the trail and you're doing water bars and clearing any sort of blowdowns that are easy to clear, like with a handsaw. Mm -hmm. And there's different expectations depending on where your trail is located. So like my trail is partially in the wilderness. So wilderness has different expectations about maintenance and there's different rules about what you clear and what you don't clear the trail corridor is more narrow Mm -hmm. you don't blaze oh that's the other thing so we can actually level one is blazing but um honestly i i don't know how many people go out and actually do blazing i think if you're really into it you might but most people do brushing and water bars um i have a question about blazing i've always been curious about this do they give you guidance on like do they basically say like it needs to be like 20% of the, it needs to be like 80% faded before you can do a new blaze or do, do people have the autonomy to just um, blaze it every year? When I went to the training with um, Kristen Bailey, she's awesome. She actually did the training that I did back in 2017. She didn't say specifically about when to reblaze, but she was very explicit about blazes needed to be a certain size there's actual dimensions and you actually have to use a certain paint um where you would blaze on the tree needs to be in a certain location and stuff like certain height um there's an actual manual that you get when you become a trail adopter that they have you go to a training before you go out and do any trail work you go to a day-long training where you do in class sort of like you learn the corridors and you learn the different tools and then You learn about the expectations to maintain the trails, and then you actually go out and do trail work as part of the training for that day. The training I just went to, there was less. They didn't do the classroom training, I think, because of COVID. So we just went to the trail and did trail work. There are expectations about blazing. You have to have it be a certain size. It has to be a certain height. You should be able to see one from where you're standing. But then there are also people who will overblaze trails. Oh, sure. Yeah, I should say, like, just for anyone listening, like, don't... uh don't do any of this stuff that we're going to talk about without being involved with the trail maintenance organization and going through the right training. All right. So yeah, this is informational, but like, don't take any of this and say, I'm now going to do maintenance on my own without anybody involved. We don't want anybody to do that. Yeah. Especially in the uh, national forest, because you'll end up in jail, <laughs> plain and simple. Yeah. And they do um, stress the importance of of safety, that's priority. You actually have to sign paperwork and everything about safety and you need to be taking certain precautions wearing PPE and everything like that. The nice thing they do offer is um, they have tools. Like there are tool caches in various locations that has a lock on the the boxes and you get access to those if you want to use those tools. I bought my own tools because it's just easier Um, And it wasn't really that expensive. And honestly, they're not even that heavy. It's kind of like once you have them and you know what you're supposed to be looking for and doing, it's like almost kind of fun (laughs) to go out and do it. I don't know. Now, do they supply the paint? If you want, yeah. If you um, decide you're going to be blazing. But blazing is the last thing you do. So you aren't going to be blazing trails, like more than likely, unless there are a few people that they literally will be putting in a hundred hours a year of trail work where they're just out there working their trail like crazy. And there are the rest of us who typically are going to be out there twice a year to do brushing and clear water bars. And then we also kind of report back to our supervisor type person that's in charge of our area to just let them know like what is going on out there. What did the trail crews need to do for maintenance like what kind of tools do they need to bring in your opinion are there enough people to do this right now or are they sort of shorthanded i think they're pretty shorthanded the part that really kind of makes me a little sad and i know it's not to be unexpected is that a lot of people that are part of these the volunteers tend to be older and there are a lot of people who are older that are getting to the age where they're not able to continue doing this and there's not a lot of younger people taking over. So I don't know if that's a generational thing where we're kind of across the board, not just in New Hampshire, 
as a nation, it seems like there's like less of that desire to go out and give back when it comes to trails um, in the hiking community. Mm -hmm. When I go to trainings for this or any of the people that I talk to, for the most part, it's older men that are doing this and they are getting up there in age and they need, you know, we need to step it up and start helping out. And it's really not that much work. Like it's not that difficult. If, especially if you pick a trail that's not in the middle of nowhere, like I chose to pick one in the middle of nowhere. (laughs) So it's hard to get to, but they give you, if you do 16 hours of trail work, you get a free White Mountain National Forest parking pass for the year. Mm -hmm. So there is an incentive to do work if you really feel like you need an incentive. Well, thankfully, you're you're posting about it and you're spreading the word about it. I think like two or three years ago, there probably wasn't as much awareness as what I'm seeing online now. I, I asked you about the amount of volunteers because... I have a heart for all the abandoned trails. I'm like, damn it, why can't we get these old trails back up and running again? Because there's such an amazing uh, volume of beautiful trails that have just fallen to the wayside that would be amazing to get running again. Like being part of the Facebook group, you see the list of orphan trails. And there are, are a lot of trails that are orphans that are really nice, cool trails. And it's kind of sad because I know they're going to end up getting abandoned. For example, the one that comes to mind is Landing Camp Trail, which not a very popular trail, but it is on the chopping block and more than likely will be getting abandoned in the next edition of the White Mountain Guide. Oh, that's tough. Like Shoal Pond is another one. So, so what I'm hearing then is that like there's a bunch of, uh, you know, there is a bunch of great volunteers, but like it sounds like they need more people and they probably need some younger people to step up and, and get involved. So, um, We'll put as much info as we can on the show notes to get um, so that people have access to figure out how to get things done. Because, you know, it sounds like if, you know, you were talking to Mike Cherum, who, by the way, like plug to Mike's uh, Redline Guiding Company. If you're ever looking for a guide service, they're they're a great option. Uh, but it sounds like you, you had the personal connection to, to direct you to the the place you needed to. But we'll try to get the word out a little bit more to... to to people, so and there's no geographic restriction. It's not like search and rescue where you they won't you, they'll take mass holes. I guess is what I'm saying. Oh yeah, yeah. There's um <laughs> people who live in Maine that are uh, doing trail work in New Hampshire and everything. It's like kind of there's actually my friend, um, this kid that I'm friends with named Elijah. I actually he asked me. He also didn't know how to do it. He's like I've looked into it and I don't I don't know how to do it. So I actually pointed him in the right direction as well, and he adopted. Um, discovery trail and he lives in Vermont so it doesn't matter where you live the other cool thing that people don't realize is there's other things you can do besides just trail adopting there's other opportunities through the White Mountain National Forest to volunteer so on their website roving caretaker is one site stewardship program which I'm actually kind of interested in myself backcountry stewards trailhead stewards so when you go to like I know the Franconia parking lot, there's, I think they tend to put a tent up there, don't they? For the, the stewards that stand at the trailhead. Falling waters. They do, yeah. Those are all volunteers that you can do any of those different things as well if you're not sure how you feel about doing trail work. Um, mm-hmm. And I was kind of worried about the whole trail work thing because I don't feel like I'm the strongest person on earth. But carrying a pair of loppers or clippers is really not that difficult if you don't feel like you're strong enough um, to carry like a larger tool, um, like fire rakes or some of the things that people use sometimes to clear out water bars or um, there's tampers, which are tools that you use to like pack the soil. Those are heavier tools, but if you don't feel like you can carry them, you can always just bring a pair of clippers and go out and, cl- and brush out trails because that makes a huge difference. What do you guys use to uh, move giant boulders? Like, you know, 100 pound oh, boulders. Oh, see, that's not something... We don't do that. That's not this level. I gotcha. That's like a um, higher level maintenance. That's more like the actual forest service that goes and does that. Trail Rights, I think, does some of that as well, which is another organization. Um, it's a patch organization. I think you guys know of Trail Rights, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Hmm. One thing that is really important is don't go out and just brush someone's trail, like you had said earlier, Mike, because, for example... As a trail adopter, if I plan on going out and clearing my trail and then I go out and it's already been done, I'm going to be really kind of a little annoyed (laughs) that I just Mm -hmm. lugged all this gear out there. So don't just go clearing. How do you, I'm trying to think like logistically, like do you 
just take a day and like say, I'm going to hike the whole length of the trail and take notes on what needs to be addressed? Or do you just go out there with all the equipment and just tackle it a little bit at a time? I'd be out there like with a notebook taking notes and going crazy. So <laughs> My trail is five and a half miles long and it takes, it's, um, I think it's four miles from one trailhead to get to my trail or it's two miles from the other trailhead. So it's a haul to get out to it. So the way I did it this past spring is I did it in two chunks um, and I went and did two miles of it from one end. And then I actually connected with the White Mountain Collective. I think that's what it's called. Um, the White Mountain Trail Collective. I connected with them and went out with a group of uh, veterans to do the other half of the trail. Um, but normally what I would c- recommend if you adopt a trail is to do reconnaissance on it before you bring all your tools. Cause you don't necessarily like, I didn't need to bring water bar clearing t- devices. Cause I, I think I have maybe two water bars on my entire trail. So it's better to do recon first. And with this sort of the, the larger stuff that you're talking about, like if you, do you have any bog bridges on your trail? Um, I do not. And those are not level one maintenance. Yeah. So even if I did, I wouldn't necessarily be doing that by myself. Like they don't want you doing those things by yourself. They want you to, if you're going to help with a crew, that's one thing you would coordinate with um, the person who's in, in your area that's in charge of your area. All of this information is only applicable for White Mountain National Forest Trail Adoption. So there's various organizations. There's a, a lot of organizations that maintain different parts of of um, New Hampshire's trail systems. And every organization has different ways they handle things. So another really popular one is the Randolph Mountain Club. And they um, they post stuff a lot um, to have people go out and help out with trail work. And the AMC also has a ton of trails that they maintain. Um, I was given the directive that they tend to be a little more difficult to work with in terms of adopting trails, which is why I chose to go with the White Mountain National Forest. And I know the AMC charges you, like you have to pay to be an adopter, which is a little weird to me. Um, yeah, but it, it it fits the AMC aesthetic, I think. <laughs> yeah. And actually they just put out a list of orphan trails and there is a ton of the, um, a ton of trails that are very popular trails are all orphaned by the AMC right now, which means they don't have a trail adopter for s- so many sections of trails that are really popular. Like part of um, the trail between uh, Liberty and Little Haystack is all orphaned right now. That whole stretch of trail, like there's sections that are pretty popular that are orphaned. You know, one of the things that you see, like uh, I see this, it's so common at this point, but like when the trails have a low spot and it's muddy, people make a, a sort of a new trail off the main trail to get around those muddy sections. Do they give you any sort of training or advice on how to how to close those off? Or do they just say, if it's a muddy section and, you know, we do they take the perspective that like we've got to fix the muddy, the mud issue and the water issue? Or do they take the perspective to say, try to reroute them back through the mud so that they're not going off and creating a new side trail? Um, well, you don't really, you don't want to widen the trail further by eroding it. So the, yeah, we want you to walk through the mud <laughs> technically, mm-hmm. but at the same time, mm-hmm. it's pretty it's like, well, they're not going to listen. So they will teach you about things like um, people are going to take the path of least resistance. So you want to give them kind of directions without, you want to direct them the way you want them to go by putting things in the way. So like putting a bunch of sticks down. I know, I'm sure you guys have seen where they've put sticks down um, to kind of block people from going down side trails or block people to direct them. Or you can put debris down onto the mud so that it's not, as muddy but for example my trail there is two very very wet areas that are almost basically like it's got to get either bog bridges put on on the trail or rerouted because it's so bad and that's unfortunately a money thing so do they have the money to do it do they have the staff to do it it's kind of like a lot of our trails tend to be in bad shape because it's a financial thing um but yeah, the the hope is that 
people won't be eroding the trails by making side trails or by widening the trail corridor by walking on the sides where there's no mud, but everyone does it because no one wants to walk through the mud. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, especially when I have new, new sneakers, I don't want to get them all gross. So I'm sorry, but <laughs> for now on, I'll walk through the mud. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't, I I'll do it. I'll go around it. If I, if it's really bad, I was just, when I was in Vermont last week, I've never seen anything like it in my life. And I've done some pretty awful trails. Mm -hmm. It's the level wet. of mud. It was, yeah, well, it, that's, I mean, if you're going to be on the lawn trail, you might as well just full send and like just experience the mud the way it's supposed to be experienced, right? Yeah, it was unbelievable. All right, so Stomp, you, what trail are you going to adopt? Oh, man, I see. I told you, I already tried. <laughs> well, I tried and I got rejected, that excuse apparently. doesn't fly now. Now you know mm -hmm. how to do it. We'll talk. We'll get Mike Charm. He'll, he'll give you, he'll, he'll tell you how to get there. So. Uh, yeah, I have a heart for the abandoned trails, like Ed mentioned. I would love to see something happen, especially with the volume of people hiking now. I think we have to revisit the fact that all these other trails are available. And a lot of them are, are in really great shape. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. But, I mean, you do enough volunteering stops, so you're off the hook. But I think I, yeah. I, I'm definitely curious, so I'll take a look online <clears> and see because, you know, I'm, I'm, I fit the mold. I'm old, and I'm a guy. <laughs> I can do trail maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know there's a stretch of high water trail that's up for adoption. <laughs> Where is that? Where is oh, that? my gosh. It's in uh, the Wild River Wilderness. So high water trail. Oh, that's close to where I am. So that trail is in, it's one of those trails that is notorious because it is just beyond like the level of damage that it suffered during um, the tropical storm, Irene, the more recent one that we just had. Uh, I think that's the, the one. The it bombs, destroyed. Bomb cyclone. Yeah. Yeah. It like destroyed yeah. stretches of that trail. I guess I would take Falling Waters. You can have that. You can have that. If I had an option, I would take Falling Waters falling because waters. that needs some help. You know, especially that the wet, slippery sections you know, up above. Like, holy moly. Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing about Falling Waters is, like, if you were the caretaker there, if you could get a hold of the uh, the trail sign, that thing, like, goes to auction. Like, I think people pay, like, 10 grand for that trail sign. Like, oh every, every year or two. Wow, really? So, wow. Huh. They do. Yeah. But uh, no, this is good. This is very interesting. Um, what uh, what else did we miss about trail maintenance? Anything? There's a lot of organizations. I highly recommend, like I copied and pasted it into a Google Doc, the list of them all. But I really, I put this blog post together and it has them all. So I highly recommend, not because I want people to go to my blog, because I really, don't, it doesn't do any me any good other than just having people know um but it really is there's a lot out there so even if you are like i don't know where to begin there's a lot of organizations that if you reach out to them they do like get together it's like the brats down in the belknap range they actually have groups that go out and the randolph mountain club they have groups that go out and the trail rights are always going out so if you don't know what to do it would be be a good place to start is any of those organizations all right well i will uh i'm gonna get that blog post and link that in the show notes and then put some additional information um on the facebook page as well as um our, our slasher podcast website so i'll work on this and then i'm gonna talk with my wife and and the kids and see maybe if we can adopt a trail here so you got me inspired that's really Yay. cool. Anything else? Stop. Any additional questions, or we want to move on to um, some talking about slides? Moving on. We're moving on. Moving on. All right. So segment two here is um, a little bit more of sort of a riff on recent hikes that we've done. Um, I wanted to grab Stomp and talk about like I think it was last weekend or the weekend before. Both of us went and did um, separate hikes. So um, he invited me. Um, but I did not invite him on my hike, so I guess I feel I'm kind of an <laughs> asshole. I'm, I'm sorry, Stomp. Um, <laughs> but Stomp did a hike with Jimmy Ch Jimmy Chaga, who was our swimming hole expert uh, that he wants to talk about. And then I want to talk about um, my hike with the Hiking Buddies crew on uh, on the Lincoln slide. So Stomp, why don't you start, and um, Rebecca and I will ask you some questions here. So you hiked Mount Liberty with Jimmy, our friend Jimmy. 
and you were like you sent me some details on the hike and I was like reading it and I was like I don't know where the hell this guy was hiking but like mm-hmm. it has something to do with a bushwhack something to do with a slide and craziness so your hip is obviously like back to 100% and you're doing you're back to doing your crazy bushwhack so mm-hmm. can you tell us a little bit about the route that you took and if this is something that's going to get people killed, like make sure you tell people like not to do it unless they're experienced. This is actually, if you're into bushwhacking and a challenge, this is actually something that is manageable, but it's going to be one hell of a workout. Um, this was the hardest bushwhack I've ever experienced. And, um, you know, the train at, at times was probably 50, 60, 60 degree steepness, which isn't too bad when you're um, avoiding a giant 600 foot slide and often the vegetation off to the left or the right. Um, so it, it is something that somebody could manage if they're into bushwhacking and have a moderate degree of experience doing that. It's not a low shoot. Let's just say that, you know, you're not talking about okay. climbing up Cannon Cliff or something like that. This is absolutely manageable, but it's going to be probably the hardest physical thing you'll ever run into. I discovered, I mean, generally I'll, I'll discover strange little anomalies in people's Instagram posts or while I'm cruising around Google Earth looking for things or when I'm driving. I happened to discover this slide when I was driving through uh, Franconia Notch, and I've seen it a million times. It's the southwest corner of Mount Liberty, and there's just, just this massive gash that runs up from basically Flume Gorge uh, straight up to just below the summit. And it was something that I'd put on the back burner, and uh, once my hip was you know feeling 100%, which it is at this point, I'm pretty happy about that, I contacted my partner in crime, Jimmy. Uh, we've done a lot of crazy stuff, and um, I'm really comfortable with, with him when it comes to new adventures like this. So he and I finally had a day to do it, and it's pretty easy to get to. You're essentially going up the Flume Slide Trail, and for some... I'm looking at a map as you're talking here, so I'm trying to recreate the route. So basically 1.7 miles in, or if you're counting brook crossings, it's the third crossing in. Once you get to the third crossing, Flume Slide Trail continues on and banks off Right at that junction, you just turn left, and you're going to see um, a fairly large field, um, which is the base of this slide. And it's, it looks like a football field. It's huge, but it's obvious. If you're walking up into this field quickly enough, it starts to narrow. The walls on either side of the brook become steeper and steeper and steeper. And sure enough, you're heading up towards this slide. Did no recon on it. I figured that it would be safe enough to get up it by, you know, hand over foot climbing vegetation on the sides of the slide. And that was fine. That worked out well. Um, So as we were beginning the ascent, the brook became really slippery. So what we decided to do was climb up about a 30 foot rise to one of the side walls of the, the gorge. And what that led us to was an old 1800s tote road. Um, I confirmed this with Steve Smith, and he uses a system. It's it's LIDAR, which some listeners may be familiar with, but it's a new uh, topographical service that you know hikers can access. And there's something called Hillshade, and he sent me a picture of what we discovered and what this what a tote road is. Back in the logging days, when they were doing operations up in the hills, you know, for logging, they would use these roads, which are basically carriage roads for, you know, uh, gear to be brought up for the loggers. So we stumbled upon this tote road, which allowed us to just avoid the, the brook all the way up to the base of the slide. It literally went to the base of the slide. Uh, which is phenomenal. We're like, oh my God, this is fantastic. And you could see, um, you know, human boulder laying, so walls demarcating the side of the roads. Steve was saying that um, this slide itself was probably formed in the 1800s when Flume Slide actually was formed, which is pretty neat. A lot of history there. Did you see any signs of like recent um, travel there? None. None whatsoever. And that's Nothing. part of the intrigue about bushwhacking uh, for me. I, I love getting away from people and I love finding routes that have not been done recently. 
Um, obviously, we're not the first people in this region. I mean, this is a road that's been there for X amount of years, decades, and um, but it had not been traveled that I could see uh, any time recently. And did you top out on? Did you did you get to the peak of Liberty, or did you guys turn around below it? Yeah, we sure did. Once we got to the top of the slide. That's when it became really challenging because the crumb holes kicked in. You know, the short, stunted, barbed, uh, it, just, it just rips into you. I mean, this is where I say that this is probably the, the hardest bushwhack I've ever done because it, was, it took every ounce of strength to break through the layer upon layer of uh, crumb holes and um, uh, vegetation to get to what I call the spine. If you look on Google Earth... Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay, so you, you see the slide tops out, and then to the right, yeah. you have to go up another few hundred feet to get to the spine. Imagine like mm-hmm. um, uh, Katahdin, the knife edge on Katahdin. It's very similar. So from the summit of Liberty, if you look south, you'll see the spine travel down maybe half a mile. So that stretch between the slide and the spine was where the crumb holt was just absolutely brutal. Once you got to the spine, it became more of like a um, a scramble session where you were just climbing boulders. There were there were some boulders that were about 10 or 15 feet high and we actually had to climb trees to get onto the next level. So there were some pretty intense portions of this. Uh, so yeah, we topped out. And what's really neat is there's Actually, uh, somewhat of a herd trail, but I'm guessing it's from people that were just at the summer and they got curious about what was down there. So they uh, probably over the years broke this trail in probably about three, four hundred feet away from the summit. And that's what we tapped into. And um, boy, just beautiful. So highly recommended. I can definitely tell like... Yeah, I can definitely tell, like, just from looking at Google Earth, as you described this, like, sort of your entry point, mm-hmm. and then how you approach the slide, you can't really see any indications of a tote road, but it looks more like a drainage. Yeah. And then, yeah, you can see the from the top of the slide to get to that spine is... It looks more open, I guess, than you described, but I guess you, you have to be there. You had to be there. Was anybody on the summit when you guys came waltzing through from that direction <laughs> yeah there had to be like 40 people up there and we're, we're just like, what we the hell like, are you two idiots yeah, doing yeah we looked like we were homeless like just like ripped to shreds dirty i mean oh my god it's hilarious and uh you know we were both pretty gassed out i hadn't done anything like that that challenging for quite some time and jimmy's like oh my hips starting to bug me so at that point okay it's not you know a problem if you just want to go down liberty springs and get out of here or we can go over to Flume and dive down the Flume slide. <laughs> so the actual Flume slide. So we hiked over and we just got to the top. No, I'm not talking about the trail. We got to the top of the Flume slide itself and just butt slid right down the top of the gully into the slide and uh, made our way down that. And then, you know, at the bottom of that slide, you have to bushwhack about 600 feet uh, I guess it would be south, but from the slide over to the trail again. And um, it was just an absolutely grueling day, but it was fun. And uh, it's it's fun to be out there doing that again. Yeah, that's a crazy route. Don't do that unless you know what you're doing, audience, because you'll get, you get yourself in trouble. Stomp will have to come get you out of the woods, but um, yeah, that's, that's a crazy loop. <laughs> I mean, I had yeah, ascended flume slide before the actual slide, and um, I knew that it was fairly loose and whatnot, but um, we came down it safely and did everything right. I mean, walking different lines so that we weren't releasing boulders on each other and things like that. Um, yeah, fun day. Wow. Well, that is a unique hike. It was, yeah. And it's just neat to see that there's so much history buried in these deep, dark hikes. It's incredible. Um, I do have those pictures from the LiDAR system of the Hillshade that we can probably link up to and put them in the drive for people to look at because it's really neat. You can see them just like, boop. You can see all these different road networks that they use to bring stuff up there. Very cool, yeah. We'll load those up in the show notes. Yeah. And um, let's see. what. Now, let's, what about your slide? I mean, 
Yeah. You went down the monster. I went down the beast. So I, I think... This is a huge slide. Huge, yeah, yeah. So far, I, I think the, most of the audience probably knows what we're talking about when we say a slide. But basically, a slide is just a huge rock slide that falls off the mountains. And they're everywhere in the whites. But there's, there's some that are much more significant than others. And I would say... I don't know, Rebecca, you probably know too. But like I would say the Lincoln slide is probably the biggest slide in the whites right i would have would ha- it has to be i'm actually not that sure i i tend i don't know a lot about um off trail type thing features geographic features i know the flume slide is ver- notorious um it's very steep i don't know um about off trail slides though just anecdotally, I mean, the images make it look like it. I've never seen anything bigger. I'm sure there might be, but I mean, you can see the slides on the the, the northern side of Scar Ridge. Those are massive. They got to be massive ledges and things like that. But Lincoln is huge. Yeah, yeah. So I um I forget what episode it was. was it episode eleven or twelve. We had the hiking buddies on, so we had Ben and Haley on. So as part of that show, I had. I had talked to Ben and I was like, and I had done a hiking buddy one at the time with my friend George. I had met George on, on a winter hike and I had said like, I'm going to put up a request to, um, to do Owl's Head via the Lincoln slide. So most people go to Owl's Head through Lincoln Woods and, you know, it's, it's just not that appealing to me. It's just sort of a flat trail to, a, you know, the Owl, Owl's Head. So I had previously done this a few years ago. My friend Andy showed me this path. And basically, the route is starting from Falling Waters Trail, ascend Falling Waters up to Franconia Ridge, and then you summit Mount Little Haystack and Lincoln. And from once you pass Lincoln, there's two small sub summits. I think there's the first one, and I don't know what that one's called, but the second one is called Mount Truman, and it's sort of the last peak before you drop into the coal to ascend up to Lafayette. And in that, on Mount Truman, there is a little herd path off to the right that you have to ascend, and it sort of hooks around. It does, like, you basically head north, and then you loop around south again, and you... If you take that herd path correctly, like the first time I did it with Andy, we had no visibility, and I guessed wrong, and I brought him into the thick, thick um, woods that we had to cut through. But this time, we timed it perfectly. So I ended up doing this buddy hike. So the the deal with the buddy hike, Rebecca, you'll have a heart attack when you hear this. But what you do is you post up the hike and you say, I'm going to do this this hike. And then random people that you don't know will hop on and they'll say like, okay, I'm going to join you. So you don't know these people. And you say so you have no idea what their skill is, what their you know their temperament is, and you know you just kind of roll the dice. So I don't know, Rebecca, you've, that's not definitely not your style, from what I know of you, right? It sounds like a nightmare. Yeah, you know, and believe it or not, it turned out to be awesome. So my <laughs> friend George, who I had previously done the hike with, he was like, I had reached out to him, and I was like, I'm doing this again, and. He's awesome. He's like this 22-year-old kid that's, he's like done 200 plus hikes on his grid so far. So he's going to do the grid, he's doing, he's gridding. So he's awesome. Like I had no, no worries about him. And then I had two new friends who came and um, one of the other hikers, she brought her dog. So at first I was like, I messaged her and I was like, well, we're going down this Lincoln slide. Like hopefully the dog's going to be okay. Cause I was like, I don't want another like rescue with a dog situation. And she was like, no, my dog can handle it. And I'm, I'm always like, you know, people know their dogs or they don't know their dogs. So <laughs> I was like, it's, it's fine. And it turned out like she has the most amazing Aussie. It's a red Merle Aussie. And this dog, dog's name was Lucy. Most amazing dog. Like this dog was perfect. Like stayed by the owner, like would handle any terrain that you could imagine. It ended up being perfect. So we had a crew of four of us. Originally there was six and a couple of people bailed out uh, but it turned out to be perfect. So even though, Rebecca, I know that like it sounds like a nightmare, like it turned out to be perfect for me. So maybe I got lucky um, or maybe I just picked a hike that was so crazy that anybody who was going to go would have been like, you know, I'm I'm going to be pretty sure of my skills. But it turned out to be perfect. So we were all sort of the same level and speed and, and, and thought. But basically, we went up 
Franconia drop down to the slide. This slide, the Lincoln slide, when you get on it, it's essentially like when you're going down it, it's pretty much like skiing, but on sand with no skis. So the whole time <laughs> you're just like sort of slipping down this thing. And what you need to do is just sort of diagonally go across it. And the width of the slide's probably like, it's probably like a football field wide in some mm. sections. So you've got plenty of room to move. But what happens is, is when you go down the slide, so you ascend probably, I don't know, about 1,200 feet on the slide, and then it funnels into this narrow drainage. And that drainage is the beginning of the source for the Lincoln Brook. And eventually, the Lincoln Brook turns into the Pemigewasset River, and it flows through. So it had rained a little bit, so I was nervous about the, the drainage, but it turned out that it wasn't that bad. But essentially, what you end up doing is you hike in this water for about a mile or so so you're in in water up to your ankles but mm -hmm. when you ascend the uh, the bottom of the drainage and you get there it's it's like a funnel and i didn't realize this the first time i went with my friend andy but like i was ahead so i was guiding everybody and i turn around to take some pictures of george and the other two hikers we were with i look up and on either side of the drainage there are like these thousand like these these boulders like the size of a u-haul truck and they're just dangling above us with like nothing holding them and i was like oh my god if these things let loose we're all gonna die but <laughs> luckily we got through it pretty pretty easily but um it was a little bit scary but mm -hmm. we end up going down the the drainage which is the source of the lincoln brook and eventually you head north into the woods and in those woods is old logging roads that will take you through to the Lincoln Brook Trail, but you're basically bushwhacking through. And we ended up stumbling upon this like wide open meadow in the middle of the Pemigewasset Wilderness that um, you know it was just like super quiet. There was a little bit of a stream running through it, but it was weird to just be in this thick woods and then you open up into this like open meadow. So I don't know, Stomp, have you been been down there? I haven't, but I was wondering, is it really boggy? Like a really boggy meadow? Or muddy, or yeah, it yeah. Was, spongy, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very, very wet and spongy. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I've not been there. It's on my list. Yeah, well, we'll get you down there. But <laughs> it, it was a cool hike. So we bushwhacked our way to the Lincoln Brook Trail and eventually got to Owl's Head. Went up the slide. Um, I was like dying on the slide. There was like a three-year-old girl halfway up the slide, like having the best time ever. And I was like, all right, Mike, suck it up. This three-year-old is climbing. And um, I guess she's like a she's like a celebrity hiker now. She's been on Facebook. Her name is, I think her trail name is Littlefoot. Her name is Scarlett. So I was like, I, saw, I met a celebrity. Interesting. Um, huh. Yeah, but it was cool. We went up Owl's Head and then we went out just the normal route to get out to Lincoln Woods. But it was a pretty cool hike. Mm -hmm. It was like 17 miles. 5,000 feet of elevation gain. So, wow. It's a fun time. Yeah, I was, was like 10, but 10 bushwhacking is like 20. <laughs> yeah. Exhausting yeah, exactly. stuff. Very good. Um, so, all right, Rebecca, I think I had one for you too. So, you said you had said you were on the long trail. So, I want to hear a little bit about that. What, what's the deal? How'd you get out there? I was actually going with my buddy Danielle, who I've talked about before. Uh, she's section hiking the AT. Um, and she needed to do a 55 mile stretch of the AT in uh, Vermont and asked if I was interested in going. So I said, yes, and we did a car spot and she ended up going, um, I got off trail after two days, basically like two full days of hiking. Um, and she continued on, but it was definitely the most muddy I've ever seen a trail. And I actually had done the first like 36 miles of the long trail up in Northern Vermont a few years back. So I am familiar like with the long trail with what it's known for being muddy, but this was like next level. And my understanding is that a lot of that had to do with all of the uh, rain that we had just got. The trails were just a complete mess and even locals were saying, like, this is the worst that they've ever seen in terms of, like, conditions of the trails. So, um, but, yeah, it was, like, you almost were, like, looking down the whole time because you had to look down to navigate because there was just so much mud. Sounds like a typical, yeah, <laughs> typical trip on the long trail. It was a good time, though. 
course it is. Any time with Danielle is a good time. Yep. Oh, she's amazing, that girl. Yeah, she's a lot of I fun. I keep telling her she needs to come on the podcast. Oh, I'd love to. I, I've actually invited her, but I mean, her schedule's so bizarre. I think she's nervous. She's, <laughs> she get, I think, yeah. Well, she, I think she also, like with her job, she might be a little hesitant. Oh, yeah, um, true. But yeah, she has, the girl literally never stops. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's busy. We'll give her a fake name. And I do, I actually do want to, um, I would be interested in having her come on. I'm very curious about like her section hiking the AT. And, you know, she just good. finished a thousand miles. Yeah, she did it. She's done a thousand miles now. She just hit a thousand last week. So hmm. yeah, we'll work on that. We'll see if we'll tell her we'll give her a fake name. We'll pick something. There you go. <laughs> um, all right. Very cool. So I think moving on to the next segment here is um, recent search and rescue and and hiking news. So um, Stomp, I think we've mm-hmm. got three search and rescue events here. So do you want to kick us off? Yes, sir. Yeah, we start over on Mount Adams. We have July 19th, a 69-year-old hiker from Moultonboro was coming down Spur Trail after reaching the summit of Adams, slipped on a rock slab at at about 1.15 p.m. It wasn't a hard fall, according to the hiker, but the injury that resulted was serious enough to prevent the hiker from getting out under their own power. Volunteers from Androscoggin Valley Search and Rescue, a.k.a. AVSAR, Randolph Mountain Club, and, of course, conservation officers responded, hiked up to the hiker. This person was an extremely experienced hiker, according to the report, and was a past member of the responding rescue party, Absar, for many years. Uh, the report goes on to say it was difficult for this person to make the call for help, as he knew firsthand how much effort goes into a carryout. But nonetheless, the call was made. Rescuers showed up. And they all arrived back at the parking lot at 7.45 p.m. and taken to a nearby hospital. This is really interesting. This is the big joke in search and rescue. It's like, do whatever you can not to have to put that call in. Yeah, I mean, he must have. Obviously, like, he did something bad because he... Stuff happens. If you were on search and rescue, like, you must know, like, oh, I'm not getting out of here unless I get carried out. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Um, And that's not easy terrain, but... I mean, that might have taken this person, God knows how long to get out of there by themselves. So, you know, things happen. This is, what What would you, is this a, a shame or a no shame, Mike? Oh, definitely no shame. No <laughs> shame. This is like getting hit by lightning. <laughs> it really is. So, uh, good job, Avsar. Those guys are pretty epic. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you know, maybe it turned out that uh, it'll, it'll prompt, maybe he hadn't been in touch with them for a while and maybe it'll prompt them to reconnect and have a beer or something. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. So moving on to, uh, this is, this is for me, it's last weekend. Um, I stayed home. This has been the weirdest July ever. It's the wettest July ever. And Nonetheless, there are those days where you get the hike vibe, like the rescue vibe, like, okay, I better just stick around because something could happen. And um, it was one of those days where the rain was supposed to stop around 11 o'clock in the morning, and and it sort of did. It was cloudy and overcast, but still uh, misty and drizzly. And sure enough, at uh, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we get a call for a hiker experiencing a uh, medical emergency on Liberty Springs Trail. Um, this person was 67, uh, a hiker from Maine. He was part of a group, and they were trying to do the the Franconia Ridge, which apparently they, they did, if I recall correctly. Um, but then just something, something happened, and um, he was unable to continue. So Pemi Valley Search and Rescue responded, along with conservation officers, and went up Liberty Springs Trail. The individual was about 1.6 miles from the bike path. Rescuers arrived at about 4.40 p.m., and ultimately the hiker had to be placed in the litter, was unable to walk any further. Now, while this was happening, sure enough, another call came in at about 4.50 for Welch Dickey, and um, that's sort of my neighborhood, my neck of the woods. And... 
part of the rescue team that was attending the first hiker on Liberty Springs uh, was dispatched and fast as hell ran down the trail and went to Welsh Dickey because they, you know, they more or less had the patient stable in the litter and they were making their way down gradually. And by the way, the first the first individual did get to Littleton, Littleton Regional Hospital for additional care. And, uh, you know, if we hear anything, we'll keep you posted on that one. Well, no, no, I guess no shame on that guy. And also, like, it does seem like this is like we've had multiple scenarios where this happens where, like, you're in the process of rescuing somebody and it's like the, the rescue gods know what's going on and <laughs> you end up having to run over to, like, a second or third rescue occasionally. But what's even stranger is just like today's rescue, Mike, I'm telling you, it's rainy and there's a million people out there. I just don't – I can't understand it. Like, the worst weather possible, the slippery – conditions they're out there anyway uh it's crazy uh yeah it just makes you shake your head sometimes but back to welch dickey so the second team diverts to dickey this person was 2.2 miles from the trailhead near the summit of dickey the original crew was a team from lakes region search and rescue our partners down south here Campton Thornton Fire Department, Waterville Valley, they all went up trail, and um, Pemmy showed up a little bit later to assist. Apparently, they were they were really short for numbers originally, and they needed more help to get this person down. The person was a female solo hiker, and she had experienced a leg injury and just couldn't get down by herself. Again, again, really wet, rainy weather, which is pretty amazing. 9.20, everybody got out. And uh, she was taken to Spear Memorial, right there in Plymouth, for further evaluation and treatment. So, oh, oh, I have a really neat connection here. Both of these missions involve the use of what we call a wheeler. And we've talked about this in earlier uh, episodes. But if you look up, and we can put a link to it, check out the Cascade Terra, T-E-R-R-A, Tamer, T-A-M-E-R, litter wheel. Um, This is something that, um, you know, it's like certain circles really don't like these things, but this new variation upon this idea has actually been uh, a really nice addition to rescue tools that we use on the trail. You know, unlike uh, a regular bike tire, this is a four and a quarter inch wide fat tire. And basically, it's a it's like one of those fat tire bike wheels on the bottom of the litter, and on certain trails, you can just just get the get the people right down really quick and easy. And it, it comes in really handy when somebody may be uh, a larger individual, you know, heavier frame. So check it out; it's very cool. So both of these missions involve the use of a wheel. It's, so it's a single wheel in the middle, and it just takes sort of the. It, it takes away the need for you guys to have to bear the weight, but you have to Absolutely. ensure that you've got the leverage to make sure they don't go flying off yeah. in directions. Yeah, you know, when I first started Search and Rescue, the um, the original wheels were just like basic, you know, uh, two-inch wide wheels from like a bicycle. And the, the camber and just the maneuvering of these wheels was very strange and sort of awkward and almost frustrating. This new design here is just a game changer, and I think you may be seeing more use of it. You know, today up in the Southern Prezies, that's like one of those questionable trails. Like, would it help there? Yeah, probably portions, but other portions get pretty rugged like your classic presidential range trails do. But uh, yeah, check that out. That's a really neat uh, tool that we have available to us. So that was uh, utilized on both of those missions. Next, so those were basically just two kind of shit happens, no shame rescues. Yep. Um, which leads us to our final search and rescue stomp. <laughs> and I wasn't aware of this one until you brought it to my attention. Do you want to cover this one or? Yeah. Yeah, go yeah, for it. I, I can is... cover this one. So, so you wouldn't have been aware of this one because I think that this was just ultimately a um, a. Oh, I forget what what is that called? Stomp one, just the fishing game off. It's a walkout. Oh, an Basically, escort. I think it was just a walkout. Escort. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So, um, this happened on either Monday or Tuesday of this week. So, uh, family from Florida. 
So I have to imagine that they're, if they're from Florida, they maybe they don't know the terrain that well. Um, <laughs> but the Hampshire Fishing Game was notified of a group of hikers that were in distress about 1.3 miles up the old bridal path in Lincoln mm-hmm. on Monday at 11 p.m. All right, so it was a That's family late. of four, husband, wife, and two sort of tween age uh, kids. I think they were maybe... 11, 12, 13, I'm not sure. Huh. Um, but the group was hiking Falling Waters to Old Bridal Path Loop, but had, um, stop me if you've heard this before, guys, but um, <laughs> they had significantly underestimated the time it would take for them to complete the loop, according to Fishing Game. Imagine my shock. Um, so, <laughs> shocker. So this to me, right, so it's 11 <laughs> o'clock when they called. So my guess is this is one of these scenarios where they're like, let's start at two o'clock. It's eight miles. We'll get it done. Um, but the, the group was hiking, um, you know, the loop and apparently a member of the hiking group was severely fatigued. Um, they were without water and, um, stop me if you've heard this before, but they, not only were they without water, but they were without a light source to see the trail in the dark. So, um, which is impressive that they waited till 11 o'clock to call because they had no light. They probably, that was when their cell phone lights ran out. Um, <laughs> oh boy. But <laughs> That's rough. I just, uh, I'll get into the whole husband wife scenario in a second. But <laughs> after considering the challenges faced by the group, it was decided to mount a rescue effort. So a conservation officer from the fishing game department responded to provide lights and ensure the group made it to the trailhead safe. So I'm assuming they told them like, don't move. We'll be there. It's a mile and a third. We'll get out there. So um, the str- the distress group was met with um, a few Good Samaritan hikers. So I don't know who these Good Samaritan hikers are that are like on the old bridal path on a Monday night at 11 o'clock. But, good, you know, they, they got a good story to tell. But they basically <laughs> reached the group at 1230 a.m. on Tuesday and gave them lights, gave them some hydration, and uh, they were able to get them out at... Um, 2 a.m. So it took them an hour and a half to get a mile and a third, even with the conservation officers there. So some of the kids, my guess is that the kids were probably bonking hard or they were just done. Oh, yeah. Um, But due to the unpreparedness of the hikers, um, they're going to recommend that the family be billed for this preventable rescue. So interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. So it happens. Based upon our bacon episode, what was it, like a dozen or so a year, get billed, maybe? Was that the number? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. It's around 10 to 15, I think. Yeah. But um, the thing I'm most curious about this is, like, I always think back, like, I years ago when I started hiking, I took my wife and kids, like, I think we were going to Cave Mountain in Bartlett, and instead of me staying on the Langdon Trail, I went on this, like, um, logging road, and I was like, oh, I think this is a shortcut. And we went down this logging road and I was clearly like, I didn't know where the hell I was going, but I wouldn't, I was not going to let that on to my wife. Cause she like, she's like, we're lost. And I was like, we're not lost. Um, but I, we were clearly lost. So then I had to like have us cut across and like do this little bushwhack. Eventually we found the trail, but like she literally still brings that up to this day that we got lost. <laughs> and I can only imagine like if something like this happened where we were like took the kids out in the middle of the woods with no lights and no water and the kids were having a melt, like it would be, it would be all over for me. So I can only imagine like what happened while they're like deciding at what point do they call 911. Yeah, and now there's a pecuniary penalty, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah. Now there's a so. bill <laughs> to make it even yeah. more rem- memorable. <laughs> so. Oh boy! It's so interesting. So we'll see. Hopefully, the husband is going to survive the the trip and they they make it back to Florida. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. That's a, that's a shame. Yeah. And dangerous. I mean, geez, how old are these kids? You said tweens, right? I, I think they were, yeah, I think they were like maybe um, not yet teenagers, but old enough where they were able to do a hike like this. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Well, glad it, uh, glad everybody's out safe. And I'm trying to think what the weather was like yeah. that night. Probably crappy. <laughs> I can't remember the last sunny day. I don't know. Yeah, hmm. I don't know. I, don't, I can't remember. Um, all right. So... So that's all the search and rescue. So I'm going to mark that one as a shame. <laughs> so just start earlier and bring a headlamp, people, please. Shame, um, shame it is. 
What was the rating scale that you used to use? Well, I used to use, so it's evolved. Uh, I used to use, <laughs> all right. So originally this whole idea, like I've evolved and I've matured a little bit, like I'm less judgmental about rescues. So, but I used to say um, it was either shit happens, you know, which is like a lot of these, or I would say shithead. Um, but now that we're doing the show and, you know, Stomp's involved in search and rescue, it's really not like politically correct to say that. So now I, I judge it and I say shame or no shame. So, um, <laughs> but I've actually, like, to be honest with you, like I used to be very judgmental, like three, four years ago, I would be like, how could anyone need a rescue? Like, But the more and more you look into these and you, you realize like how, most of the scenarios where people need rescues are just no fault of their own. Like, be, I've I've gained more empathy over the years. I don't know what what it is about about it, but you know, it used to be that I was much more judgmental. Spending a lot more time with Stomp, maybe he seems pretty empathetic. I think Stomp has <laughs> me. Yeah, a yeah. Positive you can see the director in the background, Stomp. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> the executive director. <laughs> the where right. Is she? Oh, yeah. oh, she's right there. We're going to get Mike a cat. He's on the chair right next to me. <laughs> yeah, well, we may have to, we may need to name that cat as like the official slasher podcast, like um, <laughs> uh, mascot or yeah. something. So. Make Although a, I make like a shirt. kitten better. Your kitten's a little cuter, Rebecca, so maybe we'll have that. I don't know where she went. Yeah. Probably not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so the last episode, so I was going to do two news stories, but I've, I'm going to cut it short and do only one news story because I just got a text that my daughter blew her tire out, so I got to go change a tire after this. Okay. Um, but the last article, I wanted to just get both of your takes on this. So um, this is a news article that I, I found was interesting. Um Elizabeth Warren, who is a senator from Massachusetts, wants to remove offensive names across the country from streams to bridges to forest to mountains. So this is an article in the Boston Globe. And apparently, um, and I didn't know this, but I did some research and she's actually right that there's like, there's a fair number of like names that you would be shocked about. But um, the article goes on to basically say that there's over a thousand public places from bridges to forests to monuments to islands in the United States with racially offensive and questionable names. Um, so the Massachusetts Senator introduced a bill Friday to create a national panel charged with identifying rec and recommending geographic features across the country that should be renamed. So she said, this is about ending egregious expressions of systemic racism and bigotry and taking a step towards dismantling white supremacy in our economy and our society. It's about building an America that lives up to its highest ideals. According to Warren's office, there are thousands of forest, wilderness areas, and other public lands with offensive names that celebrate people who upheld slavery committed atrocities against Native Americans or led Confederate war efforts. And then they cite this study from 2015 by this organization that found over 1,400 federally recognized places in the U.S. that had slurs in their official names, most commonly the words squaw and Negro. So um, basically the geographic names uh, the U.S. Board of Geographic Names is this panel that meets, like they meet like once a month, and they review, and they're in charge of naming all of these mountains and streams and rivers and everything. And you can actually work with this organization to change the names of certain things. And I think probably the most common one that we would be aware of is I think Mount Clinton was supposed to be changed to like Mount Reagan or something, and there's been a back and forth with the New Hampshire legislature changed it but the u.s board of geographic names didn't approve it um so it's this very sort of archaic slow process so i think what this bill is trying to do is to create a panel that can sort of step above the u.s board of geographic names and do like this large-scale name change so i wanted to just open this up to you guys because i think 
you know, there's definitely some names on there. I went through the database and there's definitely names like there's probably like 10 or 12 in Maine that like they got to be changed. Like they're racially insensitive um, and obviously so like, um, but, you know, for me, my fear is that like they're going to go after the presidentials and they're going to basically say like Mount, Wa- uh, Mount Washington needs to be changed. Jefferson needs to be changed. I mean, all of these presidential peaks were slave owners. So my fear is you know, I say clean up the obviously racial names, but like my fear is that they're just going to go after like a bunch of different things that um, would be, in my opinion, an overstep. So I don't know what the two of you thought about this, but I figured it would be a kind of an interesting topic to open up. Well, without keeping your daughter waiting, um, I think it's the right message. I think there are certain names that could be addressed. Um, I think it's the wrong messenger. I think that that her doing this means she's probably running for 2024 and she's just pandering. I hate to say it, but I mean, she's a, she's the queen of cultural appropriation with her powwow cookbook and, you know, the, the Cherokee nations calling her out for trying to claim that she's a native American. I mean, she's the worst messenger for this. And if you want to get a sense or like, you know, read the pulse of what people in mass think about this in general, just read the comments section of this article. And you'll get a quick idea of what they think about this person. Yeah, like I said, great idea. Some things could be changed, but wrong messenger. She's a hypocrite. Just plain and simple. And so, Stump, how about, let, me, how, let me understand this. So, are you saying you don't like Senator Warren? Is that what you're getting? <laughs> I have no strong opinion other than all that stuff. <laughs> Apparently not. But he, here's the other thing. So, she wants to make a redundant agency of bureaucrats that are sucking tax dollars to do what the first agency is already doing is that what i'm reading here it's ridiculous it's i think it's, yeah i mean she's running for office she's seems, pandering well yeah i mean i don't know it just seems like <laughs> they want to um they want to speed things up and they have like it seems to me like they have a full list of like 1500 names that they want to immediately change and i think like this board is like working through them one at a time and they're like let's speed it up a little bit so my opinion is, aren't there more important things that we could be spending well, our time doing? Well, that was my, my final point, actually, um, because this is the last person that's going to mention Cuba or the slavery that's going on in China. So th- this person's a hypocrite, uh, just plain and simple. Wow, stop, you. Yeah, yeah. I'm. Uh, you know, this, whenever you bring up a topic like this, you know it's going to trigger me, so... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm an equal opportunity. I know. That's one of the reasons I want to bring it up. <laughs> I'm an equal opportunity crusher when it comes to these politicians on both sides of the aisle. They're terrible. I, lo- I love the idea of, I mean, I, I love getting rid of the name Mount Washington and going to R.G. Kachuk. I think that's beautiful. And some of these other names. But again, she's the wrong messenger and politician to just, I don't know. Sorry. I'm ranting. I'm getting off my soapbox now. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Rebecca. I'm sorry. I think that we are waste. It's such a, it makes me like, <laughs> I worked in a public education for nine years and the amount of red tape and bureaucracy and bull crap and <laughs> like just complete wastes of my time that is because of administration and because of all the hands in the cookie jar. And it's like, I swear it doesn't matter where if it's, if the government is involved in whatever it is, it's going to be just let's draw this out for as long as we can. And let's have 50 billion different people have their opinion about it. And here's the thing, like when it comes to language, there is so much to it. It's not like, yes, the words are vulgar. The words are, are inappropriate and shouldn't be used, but what, it, what are they going to use to replace it? I guarantee the coming up with a new name is going to be drawn out and take so <laughs> long. And just think about all the money they're wasting on this. Like really, you don't have anything better you can do with my money. Not that I live in mass, but like, it literally is mind boggling to me <laughs> that this is what they're spending their time on. It's the bureaucracy. Yeah, it's they're getting it's, paid it's to yes. do this. And yeah, now there's like, two agencies that are going to do this. It's such it's a waste like, yes, of money. It's terrible. Yes, we have terrible 
phrases, but like, come on. You think there's something better you guys could be spending your time on right now? I mean, I have cancer. Go freaking find a cure for cancer. Stop wasting people's money and time. Like, come on. <laughs> really? They're going to get to that as soon as they yeah. re rename some mountains. Or <laughs> Unre um, unbelievable. But I did want to bring it up just because, yeah, I mean, I did want to bring it up just because I do think it's interesting because I think, like, the obvious names make sense, but, like, to me... The, where it gets really tricky is when you start saying like, okay, if somebody was responsible back in the 18 or the 1700s around atrocities to Native Americans or they were slave owners, um, they, to me, the, the White Mountains are, um, you know, they're fertile ground for renaming things if that's the criteria. So I just figured I'd throw it out there to let people know that this, these discussions were going on because... Sometimes these things have a way of just sort of sneaking up on you. And next thing you know, like, you'll hear that all of our common peaks are all being renamed. And, you know, you kind of get caught in your back foot. So I figured I would get the word out. So. I think hmm. that it's like... Plus, I wanted to trigger Stomp as well. Yeah, there are certainly <laughs> things that should be changed. Like, for for example, wasn't the Washington Redskins... Are they still called the Washington Redskins? Like, I don't I can't follow keep sports. track of it anymore. So there's all yeah. these. They, they changed. They 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 eliminated that last year, I think. So, yeah, there's certain terms <laughs> that are very blatantly obvious that they're derogatory and and racist. But like, where does it end? Where does it end? Like, when is it going to be? Where do we draw the line? Like, is okay? This person was a slave owner, and they're twelve times removed from having. You know, they they're the person that this mountain is named after, like, where do we draw the line? I think mm -hmm. is where my, and with language, like I'm, I'm working on a master's in fine arts and writing. And I took a, a doctoral level composition class last fall. And the, the amount of discussion that you could do on rhetoric and on language and all of it is like, you will talk yourself into oblivion because there's really almost no end to it sometimes. And I'm sorry, but I just really think it's a waste of money. If that's what we're spending our money on right now with the way our nation is. Mm -hmm. And that, that paragraph that you read, Mike, I mean, it's like they use the word systemic racism and bigotry, and then they mention white supremacy in the same sentence. I mean, she's actually using those words together like you know claiming bigotry and then castigating an entire race of people it's like are you kidding me i mean it's just breathtaking <laughs> it's crazy New times we live in get fired up so, <laughs> yeah it is crazy but but um we do have to wrap it up we're we're um running out of time here but rebecca i actually meant to ask you um what is going on with cancer are you are you still in treatment or are you are you turned the have you turned the corner yet so cancer treatment well, okay. So cancer is good going the same, basically. So I'm in, um, I get Herceptin, which is a more mild form of chemotherapy once mm -hmm. every three weeks. So tomorrow morning, I actually go in to get treatment. Um, my last round is sometime in mid-October. I'm not sure when yet. And then I have to take a hormone blocker pill for 10 years. Um, so yeah, it kind of doesn't ever really end. Yeah, yeah, but it does kind of. It's very fluid. Cancer treatment. It's not like you think, and maybe it depends on the type of cancer. But like, it truly is a very fluid thing because you don't know if there's still cancer in someone. You can't see a cell, so you don't know until the person's got like a tumor. Um, so that's why there's technically like no cure because you don't ever you can't eradicate it completely yeah yeah it's just like a it's like a ticking time bomb that's sitting inside of you and you know you just have to hope it doesn't and go you off. hope that you killed it all yeah like you want you do all these treatments because the hope is that you've killed all of the cancer cells and then you take these other precautions to hopefully block any future growth um but there's not like it's done now i'm all done there's no such thing. Um, yeah. are, are there like crazy side effects for the, the, the blockers that you need to take for 10 years? Honestly, I 
don't want to do it because I know how awful it's going to be. And I just try not to think about it, but it's basically like going to put me in menopause being on it oh, while good. I'm on it. And then once I get into menopause, I have to switch to a different hormone blocker. Um, it's basically making it so that if there are cancer cells in my body, they can't feed on my hormones because my hormones were feeding the cancer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so I get to wow. go through like hot flashes apparently and like mood swings and weight gain and all those fun things. And I don't even know what else. Like I try not to honestly, like I can't even like think about it yet. I don't want to think about it. This is going to suck. Yeah, well, I, I don't want to like have you finish up the podcast on, on a shitty note. So, um, <laughs> it's okay. Tick joke. Yeah. So, but I mean, I did want to ask and hopefully, you know, we're all praying for you and Thanks. you know, it's the, the coolest thing for me for, you know, just sort of looking at it from the outside is that you're just, you're doing your thing and you're just continuing to focus on doing the things that make you happy. And that's, that's awesome. So we're proud Thanks. of you. Thanks. Thanks. Absolutely. <gasps> Well, thank you, Rebecca. That right, was really. Stomp, have you calmed down? I'm sorry. Great I didn't episode. Mean to bring up politics. Yeah, I got to go take an ice <laughs> bath. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll wrap it up. So, we'll, we'll, until next time. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you want to learn more about the topics covered on today's show, please check out the show notes and safety information on slasserpodcast.com. That's S-L-A-S-R podcast.com. You can also follow the show on Facebook and Instagram. We hope you'll join us next week for another great show. Until next time, on behalf of Mike and Stomp, get out there and crush some peaks. Now covered in scratches, blisters, and bug bites, Chris Staff wanted to complete his most challenging day hike ever. Fish and game officers say the hiker from Florida activated an emergency beacon yesterday morning. He was hiking along the Appalachian Trail when the weather started to get worse. Officials say the snow was piled up to three feet in some spots and there was a wind chill of minus one degree. And there's three words to describe this race. Do we all know what they are? Lieutenant James Nealon, New Hampshire Fish and Game. Lieutenant, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. What are some of the most common mistakes you see people make when they're heading out on the trails to hike here in New Hampshire? It seems to me the most common is being unprepared, and I think if they just simply visited uh, hikesafe.com and got a list of the 10 essential items and had those in their packs, they probably would have no need to ever call us at all.